back, everyone, to the Fly Culture podcast. I hope you're keeping well. I hope you're keeping safe. Um, I've been fortunate enough to know Chad Van Zanten for quite a few years now after his discovering his blog and ask him to write for the online magazine I ran at the time, Eat Sleep Fish. On launching Fly Culture, I knew I had to have him in the first edition. He has also continued to write for us, appearing in the very latest winter edition with his piece, um, called The Audition. As with all of his writing, it is beautifully observed, funny, self-depreciating, and strikes a chord with any fly angler. He describes himself as a writer and angler who works as an ad- editor. He is based in Utah and has co-written a book of essays called On Fly Fishing the Northern Rockies, which I can't recommend highly enough. I believe there is another book coming, which I plan to learn a little bit about today, and learn about his fishing, and we were talking just off mic as well about the importance of friendships in fishing as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so with great pleasure, I'm pleased and really excited to introduce Chad Van Zanten to the Fly Culture podcast. Chad, thanks so much. I know it's early there in the morning, so thanks for dropping by. How are you doing? Good, good. Really good over here. Uh, just trying to get through the plague and uh, get back to some kind of uh, status of, of normalcy. Cool. And are you able to get out fishing? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to go fishing by yourself, it's not really a problem. Uh, and, and maybe, uh, if, if you want to go with one person who's, who you trust hasn't been licking doorknobs or whatever, you can get out there and, uh, and stay six feet apart or whatever. But yeah, that it had, it hasn't put a huge dent in just the day to day fishing, but, uh, you know, canceled a couple trips that, uh, were lined up and, and uh, yeah, maybe has has depressed the the fishing a bit, but luckily you can get out there, and that's one thing that kind of helps, uh, you know, get through the, the the crazy weird times. You know, we've had we've we've got COVID, but we we also have this other virus um, called Donald Trump that uh, we're getting. We're just now kind of coming out of it. It's you know, it makes you feel really terrible and. Uh, makes your head hurt, but uh, that, we we may be we may be through that now. But dealing with both of those was was kind of a challenge. And it looked like the Trump virus wasn't going to go away at one stage. You must be pleased you're getting over that now. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was touch and go. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about being able to go fishing and um, being where you are in Utah. I guess snow plays a, a part in life, everyday life there. And I've sort of got this romanticized vision of winter fishing with all of the um, banks of the the river covered in snow. It's cold and my beanie is pulled over my ears and I'm making sure I keep nice and warm. And I'm sitting there waiting for that midge hatch that probably only happens for 20 minutes, half an hour, if that. Is (laughs) is that sort of how it is? Am I sort of along the right sort of lines? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how it is. I mean, one thing that's interesting that I think not everybody fishes through the winter here even. Um, and and when, when I take somebody or would go with somebody who hasn't been winter fishing very much, one thing that um, is a, kind of surprising is that the water is warmer than the air. So you kind of you kind of want to get in the water, you know, to, to kind of get out of the, so you're not so exposed. And then if you're down in the in the river bank, the, the wind might not be as... Uh, you know, as much of a factor, and but yeah, that's uh, you don't have to you don't have to really wait for the mid the midge hatches. You can go ahead and nymph. You know, uh, we do kind of euro nymphing and maybe a, a, some hybridized uh, 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 methods of euro nymphing. Just basically trying to get heavy nymphs way down to the cobble where the fish are, and you know, fish have to eat all year long, and so. Uh, Winter is is when we fish, and we catch a lot of white fish in the winter, uh, as a as a matter of course. Uh, but you know, there's uh, yeah, there's fishing to be done. Um, pretty much every you can find somewhere to fish around here every day of the year and uh, all through winter if you want to. Not everybody likes that. I used to I used to do it a lot more than I do now. I think I'm uh, I get colder easier now. <laughs> it was funny we were talking off mic, and I said you know one of the things I've missed this has probably been the longest spell I've been without fishing and I'm fine with it at the moment and 
the grayling days that we have are those sort of long breakfasts in the company of good friends, drinking coffee, and then somebody will eventually say, should we go? And is it for you that you sort of time those? Is it that your fish dawn till dusk, or will it be that you're looking for that lunchtime to maximise your fishing time and being comfortable, I guess, as well? Well, that that's kind of an interesting question because um, I've always been fascinated uh, even from before uh, I, I started seeing uh, eat, sleep, fish, and fly culture, I've always kind of been fascinated with the similarities, but also the differences in the way that you guys fish and that we guys fit over here we fish. And it, it, there's there's a lot of similarities. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're kind of, I, I see you have a, a Patagucci hat there, and, you know, I'm sure we use a lot of the same gear and stuff. But I've always pictured, you know, you guys, yeah, having this kind of, um, it's kind of a social occasion, uh, you, you know. You sit down, and and uh, and there's a, a social aspect to it that that needs to be accomplished. And then there's uh, almost kind of a, a genteel aspect to it as you go out to the places where you're going, because these places are, you know, very um, ancient, and you know they've been fished for you know a millennia or whatever. And you're going out there, and I've heard that rocks and pools have names that everybody knows that everybody observes and uh over here it's a yeah i think it's a little bit more like there's no long breakfast you we we say well, let's meet at eight and we end up meeting at nine thirty five and we stop at the gas station and get these greasy you know corn dog or a or a breakfast burrito or something and uh, then we sit in the car and or in the truck and try to just get as warm as we can and then rush out and get in the water. And yeah, it's a, it's a little more scruffy maybe uh, than having, than having a, a nice breakfast uh, for a while and then kind of trotting out to the stream. And yeah, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little more rough, I think, rough around the edges. That sounds pretty And yet, you know, basically the same thing, you know, we're just, we want to go get some fish. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, genteel and me are two words that don't go together, but I like it. Um, <laughs> I'm really pleased about that. I, I think part of it, and I don't know if it's as I get older, and I think trout season's slightly different because we obviously don't have trout all season. So we're fishing for grayling. And particularly where I live, there aren't so many grayling. So you haven't got many to go at. Um, so hmm. I think that's got something to do with it. Trout is different and it would be exactly the same i would pull over if i was fishing somewhere grab something quickly and have it on my lap and uh, eat it as i'm driving along if you're allowed to do that i don't know if that's against the law or not um but if not i sit down and and eat it properly obviously um but with trout it will be very very similar and i i wonder with age as i get a little bit older and i remember my friend ray and i that we've been around the world fishing together and I, I recall times where we'd be running to the river, putting up our waders, and we were fishing somewhere. We'd done a little mini road trip, and we'd sort of gone through Hampshire into Dorset, and we're heading to Devon. And it got to three o'clock, and I said, dude, we've got to really start thinking about eating on these trips now. And we were just flying yeah. off vapours the whole time. And I, I wonder, do you think it is as you get a little bit older that you do start to think about the, the pace of the fishing a little bit more differently? Yeah, for sure. You know, I, yeah, early, early in, in my fishing time, um, you said dawn to dusk a little bit ago, and that's how it would be, you know, just fish like every minute that you can uh, and, and fish into the darkness and kind of feel your way out. Uh, whereas today, you're, we're, the friends that I fish with and myself, we're, we're not as uh, quite as desperate anymore. We come, and and that a lot of that is kind of knowing what you're doing. You know, I might need ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I might need three hours to figure it out uh, and finally start getting into fish. And now, yeah, uh, there's there are places that you kind of have. Uh, you kind of have mapped out, plotted out, and you kind of know what's going to happen. So the desperation has has gone down, but still, uh, you know, there are there are times when, yeah, you just want to fish every second, fish every moment of light, and uh, 
and and just stay out there for for as long as you can yeah yeah i've noticed it since i've stopped guiding that i'm a little bit more selfish is the wrong word but i want to fish and enjoy my fishing and even when i was fishing with friends i'd almost be the guide not in the sense of giving tips or information but just wanting to give them the shot at the pool or whatever it was now i I really have enjoyed going fishing on my own and enjoying that aspect of it so it's been really cool to look at it from a flip it the other way around which has been really really great but for our listeners um your home water if you have one you say you can fish everywhere um every day of the year if you had a home water you don't need to name names or anything but how would you describe it um to somebody who's listening who may not go to utah and fish and may not go to the u.s how how would you describe your stream to to somebody um well the i you know i used to kind of consider my home waters to be uh one or two rivers that i fished over and over again but as i've as i've gotten more experience my home waters really is um uh, this watershed that I happen to live in the center of, um, this, this Bear River, uh, the Bear River is a major American river. It doesn't drain to the ocean, but it's the biggest river in the United States, in the continental United States that doesn't drain to an ocean. And it's just, um, it, it's 350 miles long and it drains about 3,300 mi- square miles. Uh, but there's myriad, uh, uh, tributaries and reservoirs to fish and so from where i sit right now uh 30 minutes one way will take me to a couple of rivers 30 minutes the other way will take me to several more rivers and if i want to drive an hour or more i can there there are a lot more so there's not really one river but uh, most of them are freestone rivers Um, they would probably be considered smaller rivers um you know uh we're talking about maybe uh, 300 CFS, you know, uh, average flow or less. Uh, some of them are even smaller. And it's, uh, you know, fishing in the woods, going into the woods and then and then taking a mile or a mile and a half of river and just walking up that um, and, you know, doing the mile and a half that you didn't do last time and then doing the next mile and a half uh, on subsequent trips. Uh, really, um, just really pretty. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, lots of forested areas, lots of woods, um, and, uh, mostly tr- fishing for trout, uh, and hopefully tr- hope getting into some native trout. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, a lot of the rivers are, you know, kind of have the same characteristics, but each one has something that it offers, you know, uh, big pools or really, really high, high channels, you know, high up in the, in the mountains. Um, each one of them has its kind of own amenity or its own feature that, that you're going for. But if you if you're fishing in this in this watershed, you've got um, you know 20 or 25 really good rivers that you can choose from. Maybe 10 others that are a little more obscure, or harder to get to, and not well known. And then um, 20 or so reservoirs that you can pick from. And you can really say, okay, I want I want the Lower Logan experience where it's quick to get to, I know I'm gonna catch some fish. It may not be as pretty as higher up, but it's still, you know, really good looking. Uh, or no, no, I wanna I want to go to the cub. I wanna go high up into the cub and climb around on rocks and, uh, and, and be really high up. Uh, you know, you can kind of fashion your own, your own trip depending on the year and the time and, and, uh, and, and what you want. Right. And some places are good for fishing alone, some are better for groups yeah that sounds there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of variety that sounds a really nice mix of water do you have a favorite is it pocket water is it did you pools is there anything that you prefer and you go or or it's all good uh yeah there are certain rivers that you tend to go back to um there's a a stream called the cub river that is a, a tributary to the bear river um cub bear uh, and it's, uh, it's, um, the way that it, uh, comes out of its headwaters and, uh, uh, the, the way it's situated, it's, it's a little more difficult to get to. So you're not going to see as many people. Um, you kind of have to 
trudge over land for uh, 15 or 20 minutes and kind of go down into these ravines to get to it. It's not near a road. There's a lot of rivers in the West, you know, they have a road that runs next to them. Um, and this one doesn't. And so if you're willing to kind of claw your way through this, this brush and, um, and scramble down uh, rocky banks and stuff, you can get to the, the Cub River and, and not see other people, uh, you know, for that day. Or maybe see another one or two people on the way. And so that's kind of, um, uh, that would be my preferred situation. But uh, when, when there's more than one river close to you, you feel like you have to kind of touch base every now and then with each one of them. And so you can't keep going to the same place every, every single day. You got to, ah, I got to go check out conditions over here. Or I've heard that, you know, spring runoff changed this channel. I got to go check that out. And, you know, so you, you have to program that variety in. But yeah, definitely a small, high, secluded stream would be my preference. I think that would be mine too. It was interesting you mentioned, in, well, a couple of things, the names of the rivers, which um, if anyone's um, read any of Chad's writing, they do feature around the bear and the, the cub, um, which is, they, like I say, they, they sound absolutely fascinating rivers. Uh, you mentioned CFS, um, which is water power, I guess, isn't it? Because we don't really follow. Oh, yeah, cubic feet per second. Uh, yeah, the, the amount of water moving through per second. And, uh, you know, a lot of these rivers can go from like the Logan River, one of the biggest tributaries to the Bear River, uh, can go from 120 CFS base flow in the winter, you know, just down to a trickle, uh, you know, up to 1200, you know, roaring sort of spring runoff, dangerous situation. And yet the hydrograph goes up and down and up and down every year in a more or less predictable way. But, you know, some years when there's lots of snow, the river will just be off limits completely and, you know, flooding. It's, it, you know, houses and stuff nearby and uh, can, can get quite dangerous. That's an interesting way to look at it. I know we just have similar things, but not so much strength of the water. It's just the height that we tend to look at so that gives us an idea but as you well know the water can sometimes be big and clear because one of the issues we have is is you know um coloration in the water as well so um that's quite an yeah. interesting way to look at it the other thing you mentioned was native fish would i be right in thinking that's cutthroat trout um that you're talking about yeah cutthroat trout are the native trout of uh, of the west and they are, they're, they're a really interesting uh, trout to, to go after. There's lots of varieties. The, the uh, variety that, that we fish for here is the Bonneville cutthroat trout because it's associated with Lake Bonneville, which is this huge uh, pluvial lake that used to cover, um, I want to say 20,000 square miles, um, half of Utah, basically. It was just gigantic. Um, uh, and... Uh, yeah, uh, these these ancient lakes helped uh, the cutthroat come in through the Columbia River drainage into the west, and then with the levels of the lake, it helped them get over mountain ranges. So the lake level would come up, the trout would migrate over these mountain ranges that were, were submerged, and then the, when the when the lakes receded, they were left in these various populations across the west. But there's uh, there's 11 or 12 major varieties of, of cutthroats, and each state out here, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, has three or two or four of these species. And most of the wildlife agencies will, will offer a little incentive, like a badge or a certificate, if you can uh, catch all of those varieties in a single season and, and document it with photographic proof. And, uh, you know, so here in here in Utah, you know, if you can catch uh, Yellowstone, Bonneville, and uh, I can't remember the other one. You catch three of them, you get a little certificate and, and a little recognition. And a lot of people are really, really into that. They want to catch they want to catch every variety. They want to go to all the states, you know, and then and then even catch. Well, I want to catch the uh, you know the Bonnevilles from Logan and the Bonnevilles from the Weaver, you know, or whatever. You know, it's a, a, a nerd wonk sort of pursuit, or it can be. 
Yeah, I think that sounds cool. I think I was lucky enough to catch a greenback in Colorado. But then I think that it, mm. since then it's changed, hasn't it? And the, they were a little unsure whether they were native or not. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not 100% sure now. <clears throat> yeah, the greenback. What, what happened with, with uh, cutthroat trout is that all of these varieties spread out and they were once all, you know, uh, more or less thriving populations. And then development and non-native species introductions and, uh, you know, water scarcity really damaged the, the populations. So they, some of them were extirpated, some of them were just bar barely hanging on. <clears throat> and then conservation efforts come in and say, oh gosh, we got to save this population. And they try to coax it back into existence, uh, but they find, oh, wait a second, it's been hybridized with rainbow trout or another kind of, of uh, uh, cutthroat trout. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of, un, uh, of unsure uh, science in place that says, you know, what, what is this population or is this population pure? And uh, greenbacks are one that, you know, they just, they were just barely hanging on. They were uh, probably uh, years or so away from complete extinction and they've fostered them back. But yeah, there's some unsurety about uh, strain, you know, strain purity and stuff like that. But yeah, Colorado is a place where you can catch greenbacks. I think there's a tiny corner of Utah that, where uh, there's a, a disputed population of uh, greenbacks. Yeah, it was a memorable day. I'd caught on the day Brown Brook cut. I had the green back and they said, you just need a rainbow trout. You just need the, the guys who'd taken us out for the day. And I couldn't catch one, <laughs> uh, which was, was funny, but well, there, uh, sorry, Chad. Go ahead. I was going to say the, the interesting thing about, and you said about the subspecies and spotting them and obviously cutthroat, uh, a pretty straightforward cut bow. I can the hybridize with a, a rainbow trout. I can tell. What about those subspecies, though? Are they easy to delineate? No, not really. Um, uh, there are some big distinctions. Um, fine spotted cutthroat obviously have very fine spots. It looks it looks almost like pepper, whereas our Bonnevilles have have a, a, a distinctive spot pattern that I can spot. Um, uh, Yellowstone cutthroat have I, I think they're their spots are, are slightly denser and, and larger uh, spots. Those are okay to, to spot, but most of the time, um, uh, you know, every stream kind of has its its own morphology. You know, a, a, a Logan River Bonneville cutthroat trout to me is very distinctive, and I've seen Bonneville trout up el elsewhere that don't look quite the same, but I know are, are Bonnevilles. And so sometimes it takes a yeah, you need somebody along with you, you know, kind of a, a cutthroat nerd to tell you, no, 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 that's a Yellowstone. See here, here, and here. But uh, yeah, you're you're sort of um, you can't really go wrong because uh, you're going to find that cutthroat in its native waters. So you don't have to sort out what's what. You know, you just know, oh, okay, that's a cutthroat. Cutthroats are easy to identify. You, you cannot miss them. It's just which variety is this and Cutthroats have only been divided into these subspecies for, you know, probably only 30 or 40 years. This guy, Robert Benke, a, scientist, a fish scientist, went through and very systematically broke them down and said, look, these are the differences and, and these are the varieties. And uh, there's a fish researcher here at Utah State University who, who likes to, to, to break them down in terms of watershed. So she would differentiate a Bonneville cutthroat trout from the, you know, the Duchesne River uh, drainage and the Logan River drainage, you know, she says these are, these are their own thing, even though they are inter interbreedable. And where do you stand on whitefish? Because you mentioned those. Uh, are you a fan of those? Oh, I love whitefish. Yeah. Whitefish are totally, they're are fun. They're, they're a different, you know, it's a different experience. They kind of, they, they dig instead of leap and run, they kind of go down to the, to the, here anyway, they, they go down to the stream bed and just almost try to burrow into the gravel. Uh, but uh, we can get whitefish up on the Logan in the winter, usually um, early winter, uh, they start to spawn. 
And you can get whitefish up here that are 18 and 20 inches. You can catch two or three of those at a time. So, and they're, yeah, they're just heavy and, and strong and a little weird looking, but uh, no, I'd never turn my nose up uh, at uh, whitefish. In fact, uh, for a while after I, after I started catching whitefish with a little bit of regularity, I went out and tried to catch, you know, tried to catch the biggest one I could because at the time the state record came from the Logan River here very close. And I was just like, maybe I could catch a 21 and three quarters inch uh, fish and get the state record. But uh, they're, yeah, they're great. Yeah. I, I don't really have a, I don't really have a snootiness toward any, any given uh, fish species except carp. And, and uh, I think that's because when I was a kid, um, I haven't always fly fished, but I've, I've fished with uh, other tackle since I, I can't remember really learning to fish. But uh, I'd go with my grandpa, and he liked catfish and panfish like bass and bluegill. Uh, and if he ever caught a, a carp, and he would know immediately if he caught a carp. He didn't have to see it. Just down there in the water, he could tell by the way it was tugging. If you ever caught a carp, he would reach into his pocket and get out a cigarette lighter and just burn the, the, the line and just let the carp out. He just, he didn't want him anywhere near the boat. He didn't want to touch him or anything. And, uh, and he kind of, yeah, engendered me with this uh, prejudice against carp. Uh, and uh, so I've never fished for carp, even though here in the West, that's becoming a, a big thing. Carp on the fly, you know, you just like, they, there's a, a lake nearby here, Bear Lake, that has huge, huge carp that guys go out and, and fish for with flies. Yeah, it's become one of those real big, it's been there in the background. And like you say, once the U.S. sort of gets into it, that that sort of spreads the word. But it's always been in the background here. And uh, of course, Ken Dave, who's written for Fly Culture a number of times, is a huge exponent and has been a guest on here as well. And he's hugely passionate about it. Um, and it's lovely seeing it. We've, we've sort of gone from th chumming the fish up, throwing out, you know dog biscuits to get them rising to actually stalking them as mm -hmm. you would it, and i know in the u.s they sort of even flats boats are employed aren't they in some of those big lakes and fish uh, the boats are pulled for for the fish which sounds really really interesting and um I'm, I'm sort of getting my carp mojo back again i have to say but we'll see yeah I'll, I'll try it at some point I have, I have lots of friends who like it and and then they say yeah you got to come out and I'll, I'll do it eventually but uh yeah, they're, you know, they're usually here, they're usually a non-native member of the, of the fishery, and they, they do a lot of ecological damage. You know, they root around on the bottom and they uproot uh, uh, aquatic vegetation, which makes it difficult for um, native fish to, uh, to spawn or for juvenile fish to, you know, have cover. And they, yeah, they're just, they, they are a, uh, they're unwelcome in a lot of, of waters. Let's have a look. You touched on um, your fishing, and I wanted to have a look at your fishing timeline. And again, it made me smile looking at an old article you'd written for Fly Culture, and you talked about in your front yard you were practicing your fly casting, and your neighbour came over and spoke to you as your tailing loop offended him from across the street. Was that, how did that sort of come about? And did a friendship evolve and continues as a result of that? No, that, that guy, that, uh, that, that anecdote, uh, yeah, was from when I was trying to figure out fly casting and everything. And, and this guy who I knew already, he was my neighbor <clears throat> and I knew him, but I didn't know that he fly fished and, uh, he came over and he was giving me some, you know, some good advice. Uh, and then I, I, I thought, uh, you know, well, maybe, you know, we can go fishing together. And, uh, uh, he, <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he, he said, yeah, okay, yeah, we can go fishing together. And then, and then later he came back and he said, hey, let's, uh, let's drive separately. And, uh, and, and I said, that's fine. Uh, where do you want to meet? And he's like, oh, we don't have to meet. You just go where you want to go and I'll go where I want to go. <laughs> and, and it's because, yeah, you know, and I feel this too myself, you know, uh, fishing with somebody who doesn't know how to fish, it, it can be kind of rewarding because you're, you're, sort of mentoring them and coaching them, but it can kind of be a pain too, because if you're, if you're switching off fishing, you know, you have to wait endlessly for them to catch a fish and then, and then for you to take the point. And, uh, and I mentioned in that story that, I, you know, even I wasn't really looking forward to fishing much with myself because <laughs> I just didn't know what I was doing. But uh, yeah, that uh, 
fishing with people versus not fishing with people, I've kind of gone back and forth. I used to just, uh, uh, for the, the first, I don't know, five or six years that I fished, I didn't really want to fish with anyone else because I didn't want to expose how bad I was, uh, you know, because I thought I was the worst angler in the, in the world. When I started fishing with people, uh, my preference sort of um, switched. Uh, a little bit, but um, now I just, I don't care. I'll go with somebody or, or with somebody, you know, uh, somebody who knows how to fish, somebody who doesn't, or I'll fish by myself, you know, whatever, whatever's, whatever works. And that leads itself to your latest article really nicely, the audition where you were invited to um, fish with some guys and it turned out to be a, a really cool trip for you from that point of view. Um, Tyler, I guess, who took the photographs for that as well, you fish with, and you're still all fishing together as a result of that trip, are you, and staying in touch? Well, no, that was that was just uh, this past summer, and uh, we, yeah, that's the first time I'd fished with any of those guys, and we haven't been back out. Uh, when we went, it was, I can't remember if it was May or July, uh, the, the pandemic was just sort of starting. We thought, well, if we drive separately and stay six feet apart, we'd, we'd be okay. You know, we're obviously staying in different tents. Uh, we'd be okay COVID-wise. And, uh, and it did. It turned out to be a really brilliant trip uh, with, um, yeah, just some fantastic fish on, on, a, on a river that just doesn't get visited very much. And, uh, you know, even here, those experiences are, are getting rarer and rarer. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a really great day if you can go fishing and not see, you know, another group or, you know, uh, anybody else up there. And that was a, that was a great trip, but that's, that was one, you know, I've been fishing for a while. Those guys are fish scientists. So the experience level was sort of mitigated and it's like, these guys study these fish for a living. You know, they, they, they know, you know, how many, how many scales are along the midline and they, you know, they, they can, uh, look at a microscope and tell the exact morphology of, of each fish. And, and so it was a little bit intimidating and yeah, it did feel like, uh, an audition, you know, uh, getting up there and being, you know, perhaps the least experienced, the least knowledgeable of, of four fairly knowledgeable people. But, uh, as the story tells it, it, it turned out to be, you know, something different, uh, something better than that. Yeah. You know? And that must've felt pretty cool. But, but I do, yeah, it was, it was it was great, and I do plan to to fish with those guys more. And um, Tyler is is really excited about submitting you know another package to uh, to Fly Culture. He that that was the first uh, publication that he'd had in print, um, and he's got some really great photos. He's, he he just he's got a good eye, and and uh, he tries to kind of uh, do something different than the the regular you know um, heft and grin shots, and uh, and and so uh, he's excited about it. That sounds cool. We're talking about friends there, and it's really important, isn't it, to pick the right fishing friends, isn't it? And it's I've done it before, you know, and as a former guide, you know, I've, I've taken people out, and I, being the gentleman that I am, I say, well, you go first, you go first, and they go first, and I'm standing there an hour, because we're supposed to be sharing a rod on a tiny little stream, and it's an hour and a quarter later, and they say, oh, do you want to go? And I said, well, yes, I will. Um, I think I'm probably going to have to start thinking about billing you for this, though, um, at some stage, because it's like <laughs> a guided trip. And we didn't fish together as in that sense again. And, and that getting that balance right is really important, isn't it, from a competitive thing from like you say somebody says well let's go fishing but we're not going to see each other you know it's finding that balance is is really important isn't it it's critically important that you pick the right people because you are going to be with each other perhaps on a long drive you're going to be with each other on the river um and, and uh their behavior and their uh personality is going to affect you're fishing, you know, and so you, you really, it's, it's almost like hiring somebody, you know, for an important job at work, you know, you have to like really carefully, uh, select the, those, those people that you're going to partner up with. And, uh, and I feel like I've gone through a very long selection process and I've, and I've narrowed down the people that I'll fish with to, you know, probably six or seven. And 
three of those are, you know, the main, uh, the, 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 the people that I will mainly go fishing with. Yeah, I'm similar to that. And, you know, my friend Ray, who I mentioned um, before, when he was living sort of a ways away, he'd phone me and say, how's the hatch? And I said, it's pretty good. He said, look, I'm getting on a train. Can you pick me up? And it was kind of like that. And then he's moved to Denmark and I miss him dreadfully. We were just messaging actually oh. before um, we came on here and I was telling him that I was going to be speaking with you. And yes, I was really sad, but I found friends now that I fish and enjoy. And it, it's funny, you can pick up a conversation really easily, but you know, don't you, when you catch a fish there or they catch a fish you're equally as pleased for them as if it were yours and i think that for me is the tester isn't it that that knowing that you're you're okay with them doing well and i think over time those things average themselves out anyway don't they that somebody may have a good day and you may not have such a good day and it sort of averages itself out doesn't it yeah yeah um there are people um you know, I've I've written about uh, this guy Brad Hansen before uh, for articles in uh, in Fly Culture and Eat Sleep Fish. He's he's just kind of an uncanny angler, and uh, when I fish with him and other people fish with him, we just kind of expect that he's going to catch more fish. He's just, uh, yeah, he's just uh, a very focused and and very businesslike angler. Um, and there may have been a time very, very early on fishing with Brad that that, that was a, an issue, you know, like, man, I wish I could catch more than Brad. And, and sometimes you do, you know, sometimes you get lucky and do. But and then now, you know, I just don't care. You know, I know he's going to catch. If I catch, you know, a, a really nice fish, he's going to catch one that's a little bit longer or maybe he's going to catch more. I just don't. Yeah, it just doesn't make any difference uh, now. Um, and, and same with my other friends. It's, it's probably more, more that way. Uh, that, that you mentioned is, yeah, he he's, he's outfishes me today. I outfish him tomorrow. That's fine. Yeah, I think one. Of and and that's one thing you have to be really careful of. You got to be careful that you don't get one of these, you know, really competitive uh, people who get weird about it. You know, who get like huffy if you're doing really well and they're not catching any, or or they gloat on you. You know, they kind of lord it over you. You know, you cannot fish with people like that. And I kind of wonder what those people do because. Uh, yeah, I fish with people that I'll never fish with again because of those reasons, but they have to have people that they fish with. So how does that work? You know, do they just go fish and come back all angry and depressed? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it must be a strange thing. That's the, the you know, I fly fish because it's not competitive. That's the reason I love it so much. That it doesn't matter. And the fish usually beat my backside. And, you know, that's fine by me. I don't mind that in the in the slightest. But it is, I think for me, the tester is when, say you're sharing a rod, that they've caught a fish and the rod goes directly to you, or you fished what you feel is an appropriate amount of time and say, and I'll often say, I've had a good go, I think it's your go now. And that's when I know I've got the right fishing buddy, and then I know that, yeah, that's the right person to fish with. I don't know if you subconsciously or consciously think about those things too. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm interested in what you said. You're, so you're sharing a rod. Is yeah. that like a regulation thing or you can only have one rod? No. How does that work? Uh, can you, 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 you can't fish two rods at the same time or what? No, it's absolutely fine. It's just a cool way of fishing. You're almost, I guess, not guiding or semi-guiding, just sharing the experience together. So you just say, and it may huh. be you're fishing. It generally more so for me anyway, happens on smaller streams so not having public water you may have a, a limited amount of club water or whatever it is and so it's a kind of a cool way to fish a small stream you're not going to spook the fish a little bit further up it's not like you can walk a mile and a half away not always anyway um that you can walk a long distance away and it makes it that shared experience so um fishing together it's just a nice way of doing it you know it's a fun way of fishing really yeah. Well, and again, it sounds, it sounds very British, you know, there's manners involved and there's sharing and, 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 and I guess we do that too. It's just that we don't share the rod. Uh, if we're on a small stream where, where two people can't be, or more people can't be fishing at the same time, one person will go ahead and the others will stay back until the first person catches a fish. And then, 
uh, another person will go ahead and uh, and and you know we'll just kind of switch off that way. But there is a, a sort of tradition, uh, especially with a guy I fish with who's called Jason. Um, sometimes you know you'll you'll fish and not catch anything, or you'll catch something, um, and then and then if if you if the person behind catches a fish behind the person who's in front, whoa, you know, that's, uh, you, you, because you've passed up a fish, you know, and, and we call that pajamas, you know, I got your pajamas. I found your pajamas back here in the water. You don't, you never want to leave a fish. Cause sometimes if the channel is pretty big, you know, you're focusing on the left side or whatever you go up, there may be a fish, a pocket or something that you kind of left behind and the people coming up behind you have the rights to, to, to grab those. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big embarrassment. You know, it's a big, uh, source of, uh, of taunting if you leave a fish behind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I know that one too. So I haven't got that term, but I'm going to use that one. But, um, my wish for this year is, uh, for my friend Perry, I so want him to catch a salmon from our home river. And we've tried really, really hard and we had a instance year before last where he was delayed on the road and I was waiting. The water was right. We were salmon fishing. The water was right. And I thought I'll wait for him. This is, this is it. This is it. He's, he phoned me and said, I'm delayed. Um, you go ahead and of course I bloody caught cool one. And it was, a, and I said, where are you bud? And I phoned him and I said, I need you to net this fish. And I felt absolutely terrible about catching it. But my hope is this year, this year it's going to happen. I demonstrated a, a pool we were fishing again. I said, look, this is a tricky one to fish. I just need to show you how to go. And I bloody hooked salmon then as well. And that was, so I felt this, this year is the one. And I barely fish now when we salmon fish. I said, no, all I want is for you to catch a salmon. That's it. And I'll happily, I'll sit down, smoke a cigar, watch him. And we just talk about stuff. And I think, again, that comes round, doesn't it, to that friendship part of it. That's fine by me. It doesn't matter that I'm not holding the mm -hmm. rod. I want my friends to catch a fish and, and with many of my others as well. That yeah, yeah. It's a cool thing. Yeah. If you, if you go fishing with two people or three people, uh, especially if they're in that vetted, approved friendship group, um, it's better that you all catch a kind of a, the same number of fish than if, if I were to catch, you know, twice as many as them. I would rather us cat, each catch, you know, 20 fish then them catch five each and me catch 30 yeah for sure yeah, yeah. you say in coming back to the uh british sort of thing i assume you can imagine us and it does happen sometimes where i'm sharing a rod and we can spend 20 minutes saying no you go first no you go first no you go first <laughs> yes yeah if that was with my friends they'd just be like i'm going to go first <laughs> stand aside <laughs> Tell me something, you talked about the camping trips and things like that. We're not a, it's not quite as easy to do that over here that you've got situations where you can camp on the river. I've actually near where I live, you can actually do it, but there's not many places where you can do it. That's an important part of it, I guess, as well, isn't it? And the post fish sitting in the chairs, having a beer or something to eat and, and looking back on the day, that must be a big part of it as well, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's, I think would be my preferred mode of, of fishing is to go to the place and stay there. There's, you know, the way that I see it, there's in my fishing experience, there's three major categories of, of fishing or there's four major categories of fishing. Okay. So just going on a trip in here in the, in the, in the Bear River watershed, my home waters, I, I go up there, I fish maybe long enough to have lunch or to have a snack or something. And then I just come home. And, and like I said, in the, in the watershed here, um, there's lots of different experiences, lots of different water to, to fish. You just kind of have to decide on what you want, go up there alone with friends and then go home. Uh, the, the second, uh, mode of, of fishing would be more of an excursion where, yeah, you, you drive to a campground, you unload your tent from your truck, you, you camp there, you've got your truck there. There's probably some primitive toilets and maybe some other amenities there, but you, yeah, you sit around a fire each night and you get out a cooler that has beer and sausages and, 
And uh, that's really fun. But then there's, you know, the third mode, which would probably be my preferred and favorite way to fish would be the backcountry fishing, which is where you, you drive a day into a trailhead and then you hike another day with a 40 pound or 50 pound pack up, you know, into really, really high remote wilderness areas. We have these in, in the United States, we have designated wilderness areas where there are no roads, there are no permanent facilities, there are only foot trails. And, uh, you, you know, you go up into those areas um, with just what you can carry on your back. And you might not be drinking cold beer after every trip, but you maybe bring a flask of whiskey or something and just stay out there for as long as you can, you know, five days or six days until you're just stinking dirty and exhausted and then sort of stagger back into town. The fourth, the fourth mode of fishing would be you get on an airplane, you go to the UK and then maybe like a, a former fishing guide or it doesn't even have to be a former fishing guide, maybe just like a, a fly fishing magazine editor picks you up or maybe even just a fly fishing podcaster. He picks you up at the airport and then you, he just takes you to all the fabulous places to fish in the UK you know, for four or five days and then you come home. That, I, I don't have very much experience with that mode of fishing, uh, but it, I think it's something that I'd really dig. <laughs> no do I. But yeah, camping is, <laughs> camping is, is, is uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just that, you know, you go there, you set up your tent and then it's just nothing but fly fishing. There's nothing else to, to really worry about. And you just eat when you get hungry and you sleep when you get tired. And the rest of it is just fishing. And, uh, especially in the back country, cause there's really nothing else you can do <laughs> and walk around, you know? So yeah, you may fish, you know, in the summer, you may fish 12 hours, uh, uh with a, a few little breaks for, you know, five days in a row. When I come back from, from backcountry fishing, I'll take a break of four weeks. You know, I don't even need to fish anymore. Yeah, yeah sounds fantastic. I make no secret of the fact that I'm a huge fan of your writing, and um, I really thoroughly enjoyed on fly fishing the Northern Rockies. Um, how did that come about? Uh, I had recently started fishing with this guy, Russ Beck, who appears in a lot of those stories. And, um, it was, you know, I was, I was writing stuff that was, I wasn't writing about fly fishing. I was writing, um, short fiction and, and, and other, you know, non outdoor, uh, topics. And he was also writing nonfiction. He was writing about, uh, uh, the LDS church and, uh, some issues of, uh, like that. And, we started fishing together. He didn't, he had a little bit of fly fishing experience, but he wanted to learn more. And we started fishing together and it just, it just became kind of inevitable that we would start writing about our fishing experiences. So we started a blog, uh, called how small a trout. And, uh, and I, it, it seems like it was a long time, but I think it was just about like maybe a year that we said, we have to, uh, do a book. We have to, let's do a book together. And, um, we started kind of looking around for an idea to unify all of this writing that we had. And, um, Russ Beck came up with this, uh, this brilliant idea to write, um, the rules of fly, the new rules of fly fishing, um, which would uh, be snarky and sarcastic. My wife just drifted past, uh, we were going to write this. Yeah. Uh, we we're going to get 20 or 25 new rules of fly fishing. And they were going to be stuff like, um, always tell the truth sometimes, or all the fish are underwater. Uh, don't trust the guys at the fly shop, you know, and then each, each one of those rules would have an essay to go along with it. And if you want to get a novel, a fiction, a book of fiction published, you write the whole thing, you rewrite it, you have it edited, you polish it, you work on it. And then you go, when it's completely finished and perfect, then you go sell it. If you want to get a book of nonfiction published, you just have to have the idea. You don't have to write the whole thing. And so Russ and I had about half of this brilliant book written. Uh, and we took it to a, to a publisher and they said yes. And uh, then we realized that we had, you know, they gave us a deadline. We had only a few months to write the other half of this book that we'd been working on for a year and a half or whatever. And it sort of went a different way and the rules are still in there is, uh, 
you know, if you look at the table of contents, the rules are kind of hidden in there. But it was uh, it was kind of a different thing than we'd set out to to write, and it's so different from the original concept that we sometimes joke around that we could pitch the same idea to the same publisher and they would accept it again, and we could write a different book. Uh, but yeah, we just we we it just became inevitable that we wrote about fly fishing, and uh, we worked a lot. We still kind of trade writing and uh, and you know help each other out uh, with editing and and uh, uh, content and stuff like that. And would I be right in thinking that there is another book coming? Yes, yeah, uh, it's, it'll be out in April. Um, it's not it's not a team up with uh, Russ. I just wrote it myself, but it's just about this uh, this place where I live, the Bear River watershed, and all of the tributaries and uh, all of its uh, you know hidden pockets and history and uh, ecology and natural history. Uh, just lots of different topics. Um, but focused on fly fishing. How do you find that process of writing? It was, uh, the reason I asked this is that it was interesting. I'd had some upsetting news and recently, and I went for a, uh, a walk to the dog in the morning as I always do. And I came back and I just wrote something really, really quickly and it flowed very, very easily. Do you find that's where I guess where I'm getting with the process thing. Do you find that you can be in the mood or something can trigger an outpour, a creative outpouring in a different way or a different direction that you hadn't expected previously? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really, a lot of writers, they have to have, uh, they have to put in a certain number of uh, words or a certain uh, time span of, of writing every day. They write at 10 o'clock and they get their cup of coffee and they write for an hour or they write in the evening uh, or they write a thousand words a day or something like that. And I don't really, I, I've never been able to develop that habit. I just kind of have to, it has to kind of hit me either an idea or as you say, you know, a, a, a few lines of text kind of occur to you um, uh, and, and then start writing. This book really, it was a very steady process of writing. It, it took about a year and a half and I was, I was doing a, a, an essay or, or uh, maybe half an essay per month and uh, it, it flowed very well. Um, the book that I wrote before this, which is about the wind rivers and backpacking and backcountry angling, that was a really more of a hit and miss. Like I would go months without writing anything on it and then I would bang out a little bit and, and then, you know, nothing. This one, I think, um, came, this, this Bear River book came a little more smoothly because I was fishing and I was, you know, coming into contact with the people who were in the fish or who were in the book. And I was consulting a lot of experts about the history and the politics and water usage and jurisdictions and uh, that kind of thing. I was talking to them a lot, um, you know, doing research and reading a lot of books about, you know, the history of this region. So I was always in, in possession of some material that needed to get down. And uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it, it, was a, it was really satisfying to get to the end of that. But uh, yeah, it seemed like I always had something I needed to write down. So I was writing a lot. And how often do you write and rewrite? And you mentioned your wife, um, Amanda, there just in the background. Um, do you bounce ideas off of her? Does she have a look at text? How, do, how does that sort of relationship work? Yeah. Well, um, I have a writing community. We, we, we belong to a, a writing group of 20 or so other writers that we meet with periodically to workshop each other's um, writing. And so that helps a lot. And then she and I are kind of our own writing group. I read everything that she writes and she reads everything that I write. And we may not, she writes kids books. So I may not have, you know, a lot to say about a particular story that she's writing. And she, she has fished, but she doesn't fish regularly. And so she might not have much to say about uh, a new essay that I've got. But there is always uh, some consultation and some helping and, and uh, uh, you know, we obviously proofread each other's uh, material so that there's no typos or whatever in it. But uh, yeah, it's a, we have a really collaborative uh, relationship when it comes to writing. We don't always agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm similar that Emma doesn't write, but she's the most magnificent grammar pedant there is. But also... I've been... Yeah. She, I've been edited by her. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and mind you, with yourself, it's just 
American terms generally that she's um, switching to, to UK more than anything else. But it's similar that she'll give me honest feedback and I put something out on Sunday or something that upset me and I only put it on the, the Facebook and stuff. So that wasn't mm -hmm. your best. But sometimes, and it's not a finished piece as such, it's just something I feel at that moment. And it's a nice way to to get that out. But it is fascinating to be able to share that. And it's similar for me with the magazine. The first thing I look at, and writers like yourself, there's, there's very little that that needs, needs looking at. But um, I just go by feel. And I think, would my readers like it? Would our readers enjoy that? And that's the most important thing for me. If it grabs me there, then you can change things, can't you? And you can s help suggest things. And something today somebody sent me, which will probably appear in the summer edition, just needs some tweaking. And it's, it's a fascinating process to be involved with. But it's the gut that uh, hits me first with a piece that that I feel, yes, that's that's got a place here. Is it similar for yourself? Yeah, yeah, you have to have kind of a vibe. Uh, you kind of have to have an underlaying uh, uh, sort of arc or, uh, yeah, some, some kind of a dynamic response. And then the rest is just is just words, as they say. But you do have to have some kind of twist or peak or, or you know, something, uh, a hook, that grabs the reader and then you kind of build around that. And that's usually for me anyway, that's the hardest thing to come up with is, you know, how does, how does this flow? And, and if I can get that, then the rest is just putting down the words. Yeah. And sometimes it comes, you know, all at once. Sometimes you get a story, uh, like the, the story that, that I, that I sent you for the winter edition, that story just, you know, kind of fell out in the trip, you know, that's just the way that it happened. Uh, others, you know, you're like, well, this, this is, this trip didn't, nothing really happened here. What, how do I write about this? How do I, how do I tweak it so that it's interesting? And so, you know, some trips just aren't, some trips just don't have that, that spark. Yeah. It's interesting because I know when I write something, Emma will say that wasn't such a good day, was it? And it may have been a blog <laughs> I was writing for whatever it was, or even when I was guiding perhaps as well. And even it's not on a conscious level, you're always aware of it. But, you know, it's like you say, isn't it? If something really cool has happened on that trip or on that day, it flows a lot more easily than perhaps having to overthink it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do think, though, that, you know, whether the trip was successful in terms of fish or unsuccessful, whether it was, you know, you got unexpectedly rained on, you know, there's a, there is always a place for the story, uh, you know, for you to kind of pull a story out of it. You, you don't necessarily have to catch a big fish or a lot of fish for it to make a good story. In fact, some of the, I think some of the best fly fishing stories are those that, you know, something went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that sort of stuff as well. And it's funny, I, I'm re thinking about it while you were talking about it. And I, it may have even been in East Sleep Fish, I can't remember. And we fished my friend Toby and I am an amazing piece of chalk stream and it was one of those trips where we felt we were driving home again and it didn't feel it was right to finish the trip yet so he said look there's this stream um I don't fish very often and with him you never know where you're going to end up and we had to slide down stuff I don't know how my waders survived it and all these sorts of things that went with it and that was the trip that was the story and it was a tiny little unknown stream not far from a petrol station that you probably wouldn't know that was there yet that just flew out of I literally got home I don't know if you're similar that sometimes you can get home and just and it comes out and flows like that and it was funny I, I really struggled with the main part of what I was thinking to write about I couldn't do and it was really interesting to see that yeah, yeah, I, I, and I've I sat down to write what I thought was a was a solid story, an interesting story, and then realizing, oh no, no, that that the story that I was going to write is not the the best representation of this trip or this fish or river. This other thing is, and and you just scrap what you had and and start again. I've done that uh, many times before. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting the world we live in now that bringing. Um, 
a new book to the marketplace, I guess is different now, isn't it, in the way that you can reach people creatively and in, in other ways. Is that something that's in the back of your mind already about whether it's social media, whether it's whatever, that that's going to be part of that process to reach those readers? Yeah, I, I um, uh, like I said, my wife writes kids books and she markets her own books and she, she works on her, you know, she, she kind of handles her own distribution and business and advertising. And um, my books uh, are through the, this publisher, Arcadia Press and the History Press. And uh, I've, uh, this is the third book that I will have, the third book of fly fishing that I've written for them. And uh, they kind of take care of, of more, more of the, the advertising and the distribution and they put the book in stores and whatnot. And I don't really have a lot to do with it, but I have learned a lot of lessons uh, writing books for them. And the first one, uh, like I said, when, when Russ Beck and I wrote that first book, we, we just thought it was going to be so, um, well, we had a very romanticized view of what it was going to be like. And it started even before the book hit the shelves when we wanted to, to name the book. You know, we thought naming the book is a very important thing. That's like naming your child. You know, you give it a lot of thought and there's a lot of meaning in it and everything. And the, the, the thing that we wanted to name the book was uh, Always Tell the Truth Sometimes colon the new rules of fly fishing and we thought that was just going to be so clever and nobody was going to be able i mean you would never be able to walk past that book on a shelf you'd never you have to it doesn't even matter if you're a fly fisherman you're going to grab it and uh and they said well the the title of the book's going to be on fly fishing the northern rockies because that's what it's about and we said no that's not what it's about it's about so much more and uh, we went back and forth and back and forth i think uh four four sets of emails back and forth and i finally sat down and for two hours i poured out my soul into the keyboard and saying listen you can't just come in here and you know chop off the the name the naming of this book that's such a, a an important thing and and here here are the reasons and and here are the uh you know we're fly anglers we know what fly anglers like and here's what they want and this is all of our evidence and this must be named the way we want it to be named and they wrote back and said, you know, thanks for writing. The name of it's going to be on fly fishing the Northern Rockies. <laughs> they just did not budge, never budged, never ever considered a, any change. And it's because the shelf, the, you know, the, the, the shelf that you think of where your book is going to be doesn't really exist anymore. There are Barnes and Nobles out there. There are bookstores out there. But the real shelf is Amazon. And if somebody wants to know about fly fishing the Northern Rockies, they're going to type in fly fishing the Northern Rockies. They're not going to say fly fishing books with clever titles, you know, and they're not going to run across your book accidentally. So we learned that lesson. And, and that is, I guess, the clever title is sort of a um, it's a privilege that much more famous authors have and authors who published, you know, pre Amazon uh, have. But it, that's kind of gone away. And so the first book that we wrote was On Fly Fishing the Northern Rockies. The next book that I wrote um, about the Wind Rivers, we just decided to say On Fly Fishing the Wind Rivers. And then this book will be, this, this next book that's coming out in April will be uh, fl On Fly Fishing the Bear River Watershed. And so now it's kind of a series, you know, and we joke around, oh, yeah, we're going to write 50 more of these. But um, so it's at least got a theme. But I'll never, I'll never, I don't think I'll ever get over the heartbreak of losing that that title, uh, it, it was a, we were going to name the book after a title of one of Russ Beck's essays. And I just, it was just so clever, you know, it just was a heartbreaker. But yeah, coming up against the digital age when you're writing kind of rustic, you know, time, you're trying to write these timeless rustic uh, pieces and then it gets kind of categorized into some sterile nook uh, in, among the 18 billion books that are on Amazon. It, yeah, it was kind of an education. <laughs> but hopefully that will work out. And I'm looking forward to reading this one when it, when it comes out too. You must be, I, I suppose it's sort of kind of like being a musician in releasing an album in some respects, isn't it? There's that excitement when it comes out and then nervousness of, of how, how it's taken and everything else. I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement at the beginning. You know, you're, I've just got page proofs. They send you what the book's going to look like, and you have one last chance to change anything. I just got those page proofs. 
I've got a cover. They, they showed me the cover design. And so, yeah, this anticipation is building. You get a lot, a lot of excitement. And then the book comes out and nothing really happens. <laughs> and so you just kind of say, oh, okay, that's another book. Uh, yeah, you know, the world doesn't stop and turn and, and say, oh, Chad's got a book, you know. Uh, but, it, you know, it is, it is exciting. And I'm hoping that COVID will, uh, will settle down a little bit this spring and summer so that we can do some readings um, as we've done, some appearances as we've done before. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe have some excitement that way. But, uh, you know, yeah, it is. There is a lot of excitement at the beginning. And then, the, and then you have to make your own excitement by writing another one. <laughs> cool. Um, we've been going well over an hour now, actually. And I was thinking about what is it from a fishing perspective this year, you know, given that we get back to some form of normality i guess is there anything that's are you just going to keep enjoying where you are or have you got road trips you said you had a couple cancelled so have you got road trips that you're hoping to put together at some stage yeah uh there's a uh apparent there's one of one of the uh one of the native cutthroat trout strains in the united states is the golden trout the golden trout is a native of California, but it has been, it was transported maybe a hundred years or so ago to many, many drainages throughout the West. And, and there is a lake apparently in the Wind River Range uh, in Wyoming um, that doesn't have a name on any map. It's, it's one of the unnamed, there's probably hundreds of unnamed uh, lakes in the Wind Rivers, but people who have found the lake call it Flying Monkey. And it's supposedly, you know, um, golden trout, they only get to be about 10 or 12 inches long, typically. But there's a lake in the, in the Wind Rivers that apparently grows 18 and 20 inch golden trout. And nobody will tell you about it. Nobody will show you where it is on a map. And it's not labeled on any of our topographic maps. You have to kind of find it yourself. And uh, once you find it, the people who know about it will confirm that for you, and then you'll become part of the Flying Monkey Club. And yes, uh, a couple of friends and I want to go find that. Apparently, you have to cross a glacier to get to it. So we may not be coming back, but yeah, we're you know after all this COVID and stuff, we're we're uh, we're excited to make an attempt on Flying Monkey. Brilliant. I, I was just suddenly while you were talking about that, I realized that perhaps I am becoming a species geek, that um, those Goldens have been on my bucket list. The Bonnevilles have as well, but those Goldens, those little yeah. ones in, in California as well have been one that's been on the bucket list as well. So that will be fascinating to see how you get on with that as well. So, and I'm... Yeah, if you, if you ever... If you, if you ever have a, a, a span of time where you can come over here to the states and, and and we can line it up with a with a backpacking trip, there's just there's just nothing like it, you know, being in that setting and the fishing is just sort of it, it's almost kind of embarrassing the, the way the fishing is, you know, because it's it's big fish and it's frequent fish and it, it's just almost like you can't help uh, catch these you know large fish all through uh, that area. And uh, people, the people that I've introduced to it have, you know, they can never go back to just regular river, you know, plunking around for 12 inch browns. And uh, we, we've got kind of this loyal core of people who go there every year. And if it ever, if the timing ever works out, you really ought to come. That would be absolutely amazing. I'm trying, I don't think it's gonna happen this year, but we'll try and Ray and I to get out to Montana and again, if that, I know we've talked about trying to hook up in the past, and I hope we can do that at some stage as well. And of course, if I do get to meet any editors or podcasters or whatever, you'd always be welcome over in the UK to come and see our little streams. And we can spend a, a happy 20 minutes deciding who wants to go first um, on the pool as well. <laughs> Chad, it's been fantastic catching up. I feel like I've known you so long and it's been so nice to speak to you. Um, thank you for taking the time for with speaking with me today. Thank you for being a part of Fly Culture. I think Fly Culture is a better place for you being in it as well. So thank you for that. And thank you. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you for um, telling me a, lo a lot about 
you as an angler about friendship because that's really important isn't it and um your your home system if people want to get hold of you regarding the book or anything else is there any way people can get hold of you uh yeah um facebook uh on fly fishing i just have a page there that uh i just post you know funny stuff about fly fishing or, or interesting news articles about fly fishing but then i also publicize uh the books uh, there and it, it'll have lots of information on the release and and how to get it. Um, it's it's interesting. I, the the books that I have written um, do have uh, they they do sell in the UK and I think it's because of Eat Sleep Fish and and uh, and Fly Culture. You know, I kind of check the stats and I'm like, oh yeah, that's there's always a few uh, over there across the pond. Cool. That's fun. so yeah. It's just on fly fishing. Cool. Well, that's fantastic. It's lovely to help in some small way. So, Chad, I'd love to thank you for being such a great and interesting and funny guest as well. It's been, like I say, fantastic to catch up with you. And, and thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. It's been fun. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Fly Culture podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. As ever, there will be lots more in the pipeline. Um, if you are listening to this or watching it on YouTube, perhaps you would consider giving a review or subscribing to the page. I greatly appreciate it. And as ever, there'll be plenty more in the pipeline. So thank you for listening to the Fly Culture podcast. <laughs>